In Psalm 89, we come to the end of the third book uh, out of five of the Psalms. And Psalm 89 begins with a great call to praise. Eugene Peterson has said, and this was about prayer, but I think it applies to praise in the Psalms too, that prayer is never the first word, it's always the second word. God has the first word. Prayer is answering speech. So not primarily addressing God, but responding back to God. And to that extent, I think that's true of praise as well, is that it is responsiveness back to God. So God shows us and tells us of his great goodness in glory. And then he gives us a voice to respond back to him in praise. Now, many people over the years have wrestled, and C.S. Lewis perhaps most famously, with this concept of God constantly asking us to like him. I mean, uh, an insecure spouse or a teenager constantly looking for compliment or for praise from somebody else seems somewhat inappropriate. What I hope we'll see in this sermon is that praise is the natural and right response to apprehending God's greatness. Just listen to how the psalm begins. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. In these opening verses and several times in, in the early part of the psalm, we hear the psalmist speaking out words of praise, an overflow of our grateful heart. There are a few techniques that are used in Hebrew poetry that are worth just noting as we look at this psalm. Poetry in the Bible is, is not about rhythm or rhyme, it's more about a use of words that enables us to join in the sentiments that are being expressed. And uh, theologians talk about the parallelism that you find within the Psalter. And there are two sorts of parallelism, which I hope that um, once we've understood them better, we'll be able to use to good effect. The first is what's called synonymous parallelism. Note it in that first verse. So he begins, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. So speaking out words of praise of God's enduring love. Then the second half of the verse, with my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. So he will sing and he will use his mouth and he will make God's love or his faithfulness known for all generations. So, so the psalmist here, as it were, says the same thing, but using slightly different words so that we might get a fuller picture of what this praise looks like. Again, I'll declare your love stands firm forever first half of the verse, second half of the verse, you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. And this use of um, synonyms or tautology of saying the same thing but in a new way enables us to come at God's character with fresh words of adoration on our lips. There's a second technique that he uses to enrich our praise, and you'll notice that in verse 5. He says, the heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. And here, the second half of the verse elaborates the first half. So the heavens, if we look up to the sky, Lord, we can see a sense of your greatness and wonder. But also your faithful ones, indeed the assembly of saints gathered here but supremely above, also add to that praise as well. So here he builds upon what he says in the first half of the verse by elaborating it and joining others in as well. And you find that in the praises of the Psalms. They're not purely individualistic. It's not just he says me alone. He says that what I do is done by the whole of creation and all of God's people. God is to be praised in verses 5 to 8 of this psalm for his greatness and his goodness. Who in the skies can compare with you, Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? Your faithfulness surrounds you. God is incomparable. 
God is to be held in highest honour and supreme. God is also awesomely powerful. The surging sea, the sea was often uh, something to be feared and something um, to be held in great awe. Uh, but God, we're told, rules over the sea. God crushes Rahab just like he crushed uh, the people of uh, Egypt as they pursued them across the divided waters. Praise, C.S. Lewis discovered, is nothing other than an invitation to enjoy God. But of course, I mentioned C.S. Lewis's anxiety about praise. Is it weird? Is it strange that, that God should constantly be asking us to like him? And C.S. Lewis, I think, quite helpfully says that there are a number of things about praise that will help us here. The most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, he said, had strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment or approval or the giving of honour. But I'd never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise unless shyness or the fear of boring people brings it into check. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses. Readers praising their favorite poet. Walkers praising the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historic personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, and even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed he says, how the humblest and at times most balanced and capacious minds praised most, while cranks and misfits and malcontents praised the least. The good critics found something to praise in many imperfect works. The bad ones continually narrowed the list of books we might be allowed to read. Except where intolerable adverse circumstances interfere, praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. And that's a helpful thought, isn't it? Because the psalmist is concerned that the human heart should be healthy. This inner health, Lewis speaks of, will overflow in words of thanks and adoration and blessing of God. And he says, Lewis, this is, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. So the psalmist invites us to respond back to God with words of praise. And that means, I think, that we need to use our imaginations well as we use this Hebrew hymn book to speak back words of praise to the living God. And there is within the Psalms, it seems to me, a way of entering into human consciousness that might perhaps get below the radar of where people are expecting. We preachers tend to be good at using persuasive arguments to explain the truth of the faith. We preachers also tend to be quite good at telling people what they need to do, do in response to that challenge. But there's a third thing that the psalmist does, which is to capture our imagination and to speak to us not just at the level of head, uh, not just at the level of actions, but also at the level of heart. And therefore, we need to allow our imaginations to enter into the world of the psalmist so that we can use his words to praise God. And that means as well, I think, that we need to ponder, to slow down and to allow the scriptures to be absorbed within us. God has not finished his work when we've arrived at the point of thinking we've understood the text. God wants to also warm our heart, what the Puritans called our affections, so that we will feel not only the cognitive, but also the emotional impact of the text and be moved to worship God as he truly is worthy. 
And that's why as the psalmist goes on through Psalm 89 and in miniature really summarizes almost everything else in the Psalms, the, the, the calls for prayer, the, the reminder of God's covenant promises, the expectation of a coming Messiah, the anxiety over living in a fallen world, he nevertheless ends the end of book three with a return to praise. Praise be to the Lord forever, amen and amen. And actually the New Testament encourages us to do just the same. So for example, um, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, when he speaks about the mark of being filled with the Spirit in chapter five, he says this, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think there Paul invites us too into this responsive mode to sing and make music to the Lord, to speak out words of praise, and to invite others to join us as we as God's corporate people praise and worship and adore him as we give him the honor that is due to his name.